So the frontline therapy for diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, has been our job. Uh, I think it, uh, it's, it's fair to say that our job is the current standard of care. Uh, there have been a few alternative treatment regimens uh, tried historically, but none of them has been shown to be superior to our job in a phase three randomized trial. Uh, there are more intensive regimens which are sometimes applied to patients with higher risk diseases but again uh, there is no data to say that any of them is any superior to our job in a randomized compar comparison trial so our job has stood the test of time and is uh, is given to patients up to the age of 80 for patients over the age of 80 currently we use a reduced uh, version of our job as in a mini our job regimen uh, recently, we have seen data from the Polarix study, uh, which has compared our chop with uh, polartuzumab with RCHP, and it has shown around a 6% improvement in PFS for the polartuzumab RCHP arm. Uh, this trial was primarily for patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma with IPI 2 to 5, and uh, you know the improvement in PFS has not yet translated into improvement in overall survival, so that is again something that we will wait to see with passage of time. In terms of second line diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, treatments, currently we assess patients either as transplant eligible or transplant ineligible. So transplant eligible patients will receive two to three cycles of a chemoimmunotherapy, usually with a platinum containing regimen such as RGDP, RIS, RDHAP or RESHAP. And if they have chemosensitive disease, they will receive consolidation with autologous stem cell transplant. So outcomes with this strategy uh, historically have not been that good, especially for patients who have primary refractory disease or those who relapse within 12 months of their frontline uh, treatment. Uh, so recently we have seen data from the Zuma 7 study, uh, which has shown a significant improvement in EFS and PFS for patients uh, in this group. Uh, and we've also seen data from the TRANSFORM study, which has uh, used uh, lisocaptagene maralucel uh, in a similar kind of study design, once again showing a significant improvement in EFS for this uh, patient group. There was also a third study uh, using tisagen leclucel, uh, the Belinda study, which was also a phase three study with a similar study design, uh, Belinda did not show an improvement uh, in EFS for patients uh, in this setting. And in the second line setting, transplant ineligible patients, treatment options historically have been very limited. Many a times we use uh, platinum containing, gemcitabine containing regimens such as RGEMOX. Uh, the long term uh, survival with these regimens is generally around 10 to 15 percent. So there is a big area of, of unmet need here in, in the non-transplant eligible patient population. In the last few years we've been lucky in the sense there have been more treatment options coming available to this patient group as well. We have polartuzumab, bendamustine, rituximab now uh, available to us through the CDF for uh, this patient group, which has shown better response rates uh, in, in uh, compared to historic uh, treatments available to these patients. We also have tafacitumab, lenalidomide, which has got a UK marketing authorization now, and it is currently going through a nice process. Again, very encouraging response rates and uh, uh, responses seem to be durable in a proportion of patients. So these are two new treatment options for the non-transplant eligible patients. And not to forget, CAR T therapy is currently available in this third line for a proportion of patients who are not transplant eligible, but we would still consider them to be transplant eligible. And typically these patients would fall into the age group of between 70 to 80 years. So a significant progress being made for this group of patients.